Okay, we're going to talk about the cortical spinal tract and answer the what questions. What is the cortical spinal tract? What are upper and lower motor neurons? What's the pathway of descending motor commands from the cortex all the way down the spinal cord to skeletal muscles? Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. So the cortical spinal tract is the primary motor pathway for voluntary, willed motor control. And it consists of two neurons. One, two. The first one is called the upper motor neuron because it arises way up high in the central nervous system in the cerebral cortex. Its axon descends through the internal capsule and brainstem, and at the level of the pyramids, decussates to the contralateral side, continues down in synapses in the spinal cord with the lower motor neuron and the cell bodies housed in the ventral horn gray matter. The axon goes out and it does this, shing, one more time, shing, what results in muscle movement. And that was fun. Let's do it again, shall we, with this picture here where it shows a coronal section of the cerebral cortex and then cross sections of midbrain pons and medulla, which are brainstem, and then the decussation of the pyramids and then spinal cord levels, C1, C7, T4, and L4. So the brainstem and spinal cord are gonna be in cross sections to show this and then the cerebral cortex is gonna be shown in a coronal section. So let's start with the upper motor neuron in way up in the left portion of the uh, cerebral cortex, and there is a neuronal cell body. Now, we're gonna take a bit of a tangent here and blow up that part, and we're gonna see here is the pre-central gyrus, also known as our primary motor cortex, everything outlined in yellow. To see this, we'll look at a lateral view of the brain. There in green is our central sulcus, and right before it is the precentral gyrus, or the primary motor cortex. Now, the motor homunculus is this, and which it means little man, and it's a map of the in the precentral gyrus that's dedicated to processing motor control. And you'll notice it's disproportionate. So you notice, like in the lower limb and the trunk, and then this huge hand, because innervation to more complex areas like the hand is disproportionately shown in the cerebral cortex there. And so, what we see is these upper motor neurons are rising from the cerebral cortex and descending down. Uh, to the spinal cord, so we call this the cortico, cerebral cortex, spinal, spinal cord tract. Cool. Now you also notice in the motor homunculus, we got this elements of the head. And so we have there, that part of the cerebral cortex dedicated, and the upper motor neurons come down, and 50% of them synapse with lower motor neurons on the ipsilateral side, and 50% decussate and synapse with lower motor neurons on the contralateral side. And so in the pons, they're synapsing with the trigeminal and facial motor nuclei, and in the medulla, the hypoglossal nucleus and the nucleus ambiguous. And so when early anatomists looked at the pons medulla, they said, you know what that looks like? A vegetable bulb. And so they called the pons medulla the bulb. So this tract is called the cortico, cerebral cortex, bulbar tract is where it gets its name. Uh, going to cranial nerve motor nuclei in the pons and the medulla. Now I just want to highlight something here. You see that facial motor nucleus? I want you to pay close attention. This is unique in clinical testing. Uh, uh, if you're not familiar, go to the facial or Bell's palsy and stroke video tutorial on YouTube and to learn about what makes us unique. Okay, so now let's go back to what we had here. And so this upper motor neuron cell body sends its axon down through the internal capsule and then through the midbrain, down through the pons, and down through the medulla, and there's our corticospinal tract or brainstem. So let's blow that up a little bit and take a look at each of these sections. So in the midbrain, there are these cerebral peduncles, and right in the middle is where this cortical spinal tract the upper motor neurons descend, and then into the pons, through the pons proper, and then the medulla into the pyramids. Now, this is where it gets cool. And what happens is the pyramids is where this process of decussation occurs, which means to cross over. 90% of all upper motor neurons, once they hit the pyramids, are going to decussate at the bottom of the pyramids to the contralateral side. And that is what is known as the lateral cortical spinal tract in the white matter of the spinal cord. Now, 10%, are going to then stay ipsilateral, and we call that the anterior cortical spinal tract. But since 90% of the fibers cross, that's what we're focusing on clinically is the most relevant. 
Okay, so here we have now a, a picture of the base of the brain, and there is the cerebral peduncle in the midbrain, there's cerebral peduncle, there is the pons proper, there's the pons proper, there's the pyramid, there's the pyramid, and then there's the spinal cord, and there's the spinal cord. Now watch what happens with the upper motor neuron as it descends down and it decussates at the pyramid to the contralateral spinal cord. Now let's watch the same thing. Upper motor neuron goes from cerebral peduncle into the pons proper through the pyramids, decussates to the contralateral spinal cord, just like that. So in a nutshell, what happens is the following. Upper motor neurons descending in the brainstem influence muscles on the contralateral side of the body. Okay, so going back into here and we see there is in the pyramids, we see this upper motor neuron course and decussate to the contralateral spinal cord, and there's that decussation, and then descends in this lateral cortical spinal tract or just cortical spinal tract. And then you see this upper motor neuron descending down each segmental spinal cord level to synapse with the lower motor neuron and a ventral horn at some segmental level. So here we have the cortical spinal tract in the spinal cord. So let's blow that up a little bit and take a look. So what we see is the ventral horn gray matter and there's a dorsal horn gray matter. And so if we're saying, how do we identify in sections of the spinal cord, either grossly or with imaging, where the cortical spinal tract is located? Well, I know it's lateral in the white matter, so then I just sneak close to the dorsal horn and shing, there it is. So let's do that again. There's the dorsal horn, there's lateral white matter, there is the cortical spinal tract. Dorsal horn, lateral white matter, cortical spinal tract, and this is the same on both sides. Okay, so now what we see here is the lower motor neuron has its cell body in the uh, ventral horn of the gray matter, and its axon then exits via the ventral root, ventral ramus, and then out to synapse in a skeletal muscle to result in this. Shing, one more time, shing, cool. Now, <coughs> if we blow up, there is a somatotopic organization of ventral horn gray matter. So in the cervical region, bam, we then show this somatotopic organization where extensors are close to the front of the ventral horn, flexors are close to the back, axial musculature, musculature are medial, and distal musculature is lateral. Let's take a look at the lumbar level, the same thing in that ventral horn where flexors and extensors are um, posterior and anterior, respectively, and axial and distal muscles are medial and lateral, respectively. Okay, so this picture shows a cross-section of the L4 spinal cord level, a lower motor neuron in orange, synapsing with the muscle at the neuromuscular junction. Now, what is that? Well, let's take a look in more detail. Replace that neuron with this lower motor neuron, and we'll talk about that at a neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine is what acts in this junction. And so we're gonna take this lower motor neuron and a skeletal muscle, we're gonna zoom in and it's gonna look like this. And so what happens is in the uh, lower motor neuron, acetylcholine is that neurotransmitter, which is gonna to bind to nicotinic cholinergic receptors on all skeletal muscles. And so NM is often what's used, big N for nicotinic, little m for muscle. So an action potential, basically uh, goes down this lower motor neuron, causes release of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction synapse, and acetylcholine binds to this nicotinic cholinergic receptor, resulting in muscle contraction from here to here. And so, um, yeah, that's acetylcholine. And so what can happen is diseases can affect the lower motor neuron or acetylcholine or the receptor. Now, let's take a look at this picture. This is basically showing everything we just covered in overview. So what I wanna do is take a fork in the road for just a second. So here we've got the corticospinal tract, and this is also called the pyramidal system because these the upper motor neuron cell body is called the pyramid cell, for the big ones, I should say, not all of them, but the big ones, and the axon decussates at the pyramids. The pyramidal system is the direct system. Now. The extra pyramidal system are these two other systems that are indirect, the way that they influence the cortical spinal tract, the basal ganglia and cerebellum. And so I just wanted to take a second and talk how the basal ganglia is a group of gray matter structures that are deep in the cerebral hemispheres. In this coronal section, you can see the left ventricle and the thalamus. There, right on the side of the left ventricle is the caudate nucleus. And then you've got the putamen and the globus pallidus. Those are three of the main 
parts of the basal ganglia that are indirect pathway influencing willed and voluntary movements of the cortical spinal tract, and they provide input to the thalamus, which then influences the cortical spinal tract. We also have the cerebellum in the sagittal section, which is there, which provides smooth, coordinated movements, uh, like posture, balance, and coordination. That's how the cerebellum taking lots of input from segmental spinal cord levels and from tendons and ligaments from all over the body and giving that to the thalamus, which then influences the cortical spinal tract. So the main thing is you've got a pyramidal system, and which is direct, and extrapyramidal system, which is indirect. Okay, let's talk about lesions for a minute. So there is where decussation occurs at the pyramid. And so lesions above the decussation produce contralateral deficits, whereas lesions below the decussations this decussation produce ipsilateral deficits. There is lesson one. Lesson two on lesions is that an upper motor neuron lesion, which is anywhere from the cerebral cortex all the way down to anywhere in the white matter of the spinal cord, produces effects on many muscles, like lots of muscles, because at the, the level of the lesion, all muscles below that are affected. And it results in muscle weakness from mild to severe weakness or paralysis. But upper motor neuron lesions cause hypertonia, really, really tight muscles. And as a result, there's no muscle atrophy or very little muscle atrophy. And upper motor neuron lesions cause hyperreflexia of those deep tendon reflexes. And the Babinski sign is one of the signs uh, in adults of an upper motor neuron lesion. So here we've got is stroking that black line is stroking the bottom of the foot and normal, the toes curve. But in the Babinski sign, the large toe, the great toe, dorsiflexes or extends, and the other toes, the lesser toes, curve or flex. So there is an adult Babinski sign where you see this dorsal flexion of the great toe. That's bad. That means there's an upper motor neuron lesion. Now in infants, like this newborn, when you see and you stroke their foot and the great toe goes up, that's normal because their white matter uh, is not fully myelinated yet um, um, until like 12 years of uh, 12 years, 12 months of age, and so forth. Now, the Babinski sign is named after Joseph Babinski, who is this Polish but French trained neurologist. And uh, he was the favorite student of Jean Martin Charcot, who is this uh, very famous uh, neurologist. And he was big, known for hypnosis and did a lot uh, with describing in, in psychiatry and hysteria, and also his Charcot-Marie tooth disease is named after him, and Tourette syndrome and so forth. And he's quite the legacy, and he worked alongside Sigmund Freud, and what people know as the id and the ego and the superego dreams, and he liked cocaine as an analgesia. A lot of people do, but it's not legal. I guess it was legal back there. And he was also big in psychoanalysis that he got from a lot from working with Joseph Brewer, who is this distinguished physician in neurophysiology. And he's the one uh, partly in the team that did the hearing Brewer in uh, uh, inflation reflex with regards to the lungs, who probably knew Kevin Bacon and they play guitar together. All right, so upper motor neuron lesions is there. So now let's go to lower motor neuron lesions, and there is from anywhere from the ventral horn through the ventral root, ventral ramus, out to the skeletal muscle and synapse. There is limited number of muscles affected compared to upper motor neuron be lesions because you're just working at that segmental level. Uh, so think myotomes. This is going to result in muscle weakness and even paralysis. And this is going to result in hypotonia, flaccid muscles. And this is going to have prominent muscle atrophy and they will have hyporeflexia of deep tendon reflexes and acutely have fasciculations where you get this quivering of muscles under the skin. Now let's do some practice problems, shall we? What motor loss would be expected if the right corticospinal tract at the L4 spinal cord region were damaged. Now, if you want to work on this in your own, just press pause. I'm going to go on and explain the answer. So when we take a look at here, that X represents where the lesion is. And so a descending uh, neuron would get blocked and everything below would be affected. So watch in the cervical region, upper motor neuron, le uh, neuron comes down, synapses and lower motor neuron, le uh, neuron, no problem. Upper motor neuron comes down in the cortical spinal tract to the thoracic region, Lower motor neurons are just fine. But watch what happens when upper motor neurons come down to the L4 level. 
it can't get through. So I grayed out that lower motor neuron is not getting innervated, nor will anything in the sacral region. So everything below at the level and below L4. So upper motor neurons cannot innervate lower motor neurons on the same side of the body at or below the lesion. Here to there, which results in this. Shing! That's what we could uh, guess. Now, what about motor loss to be expected if the right cerebral peduncle of the midbrain was injured like that? Well, press pause if you don't if you want to think of the answer on your own for now. Let's go through and do this one as a group. So there is the lesion and watch as that upper motor neuron comes down and gets stopped. Basically everything downstream on the contralateral side at every segmental level is going to be affected. So upper motor neur upper motor neurons cannot innervate Lower motor neurons on the opposite side of the body at and below the level of the lesion. There is going to go into the left side. Shing! That's the effect that's going to happen as a result of a lesion of the right cerebral peduncle of the midbrain. You'll notice that on the left side, that entire uh, upper motor and lower motor neuron are unaffected, so muscles on the right side of the body in this patient would be okay. So here we have the cortical spinal tract. And we have upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. And that, my friends, is the corticospinal tract in a nutshell.